Okay, so we are in the ICU and we're going to be talking about acid base. So, how do we diagnose metabolic acidosis? Well, how, do we, how do we get a diagnosis? And don't say arterial pH because that's not the answer. How do you diagnose metabolic acidosis? PH by carbon metabolic By carb. Serum bicarbonate. So the, so the serum bicarb is how you diagnose metabolic acidosis, okay? If the serum bicarbonate is low, that's acidosis, all right? Why bicarb? <coughs> why, why the serum bicarb? Why not the serum chloride? Why not the serum sodium? How come the serum bicarbonate? Correct. Bicarbonate is the primary buffer of the body, which is why we measure it, right? Bicarbonate is the first buffer. It's the, it's the primary buffer in the body. That's why we measure serum bicarbonate. So when the bicarbonate is low, that means it's being consumed. It's buffering acid, right? So when the bicarb is low, that's, that's metabolic acidosis, period. Now, the pH will help quali qualify the, the acidosis. It is. Pure metabolic acidosis? Is there a mixed picture? All that stuff. But that's where pH comes in. It's there's just simply anyone with a low bicarbonate has metabolic acidosis. Whether it's compensated or not compensated, we'll talk about that later. It's met metabolic acidosis is low serum bicarbonate. Now, so there's two types of metabolic acidosis, right? Or are there more than two types of metabolic acidosis? How many types of met metabolic acidosis are there? No. Nothing to do with compensation. There are two types. Nope. No, nothing to do with pH. Oh, anion gap versus non anion gap. Exactly. You have an anion gap metabolic acidosis or a non anion gap metabolic acidosis. So you have a low bicarbonate. Now you look. Okay, is there an anion gap or is there no anion gap? And remember the remember the anion gap is the is serum sodium minus the the sum of the serum chloride plus the bicarbonate, right? Some people also fact bring in potassium into it, but typically. It's, this, it's the difference between the sum of the chloride and the bicarb minus serum sodium, right? And the, a normal anion gap is typically 12 with a range, okay? So normal is about 12, okay? And then, so, so now, what are the causes of an anion gap metabolic acidosis? Remember, we have all the different acronyms. Remember, it was mud piles. Now it was uh, gold mark. Yeah, is the one now gold mark. So, what's what's G? Glycols, ethylene glycol, polyethylene glycol. Okay, that's okay. O is oxy five oxy metaproline. I've never seen that before. Um, L is lactic. L lactic acidosis. D is D lactic acidosis. D lactate is the one you find with metformin toxicity. Mm. There's L lactate, it's the L isomer of, lact of lactic acid, and then there's the D isomer of lactic acid you see mainly with, met with metformin. Okay? Uh, M, methanol. All right, if someone drinks uh, STP, you know the the fuel, uh, you know the fuel tank. Uh, that's methanol, right? A. How about K? Ketones. Ketones. So, keto ketoacidosis, right? Uh, A is aspirin, right? And then R is. Renal failure. 
So those are the main causes of metabolic. So if you have a if you have a metabolic acid, an anion gap, <laughs> metabolic acidosis, you look for one of these things: ethylene glycol, lactic acid, renal failure, aspirin, sal salicylate toxicity. That's where mud piles S came from, you know. Methanol. Those are the main causes of an anion gap metabolic acidosis. Non-anion gap metabolic acidosis, you have the renal tubular acidoses, you have over resuscitation with saline. You know, I'm Dr. Hasabolus, right? But if when I went wild with my saline bolus, I actually caused a, a, a non-gap acidosis from chloride. I've never heard that nickname, Hussabolus. Dr. Hasabolus. That's what they, they made fun of me. So <laughs> they totally made fun of me, called me Dr. Hasabolus. And you know what? I've been vindicated. There is his, there is randomized controlled trial data showing that Dr. Hasabolus is, is right, <laughs> or at least he's not wrong. Got ran, randomized controlled trial data. Anyway, non non anion gap metabolic acid. Okay, so when once you got the diagnosis, right, you to treat it, you treat the underlying cause. Okay, so if you have a lactic acidosis from bowel perforation, you treat it for surgery. Right? If you have methanol toxicity, you treat the methanol. You know, aspirin, you treat the aspirin toxicity. Renal failure, you fix the renal failure. The ketoacidosis, you treat the ketoacidosis, and then the anion gap metabolic acidosis will resolve or should should resolve. Right, um, a lot of times in non anion gap, like after DKA is fixed, you'll still have a persistent non-gap acidosis. It doesn't takes longer to go away, right? So those are the main those are the main causes of the, of the non-gap um, diarrhea, uh -uh. right? So you'll have post DKA, yeah. okay? Exactly. You'll have diarrhea will cause a non a non-gap metabolic acidosis. The renal tubular acidosis, type one, type two, type, you know, type four, those are non-gap acidosis. Um, Hypo, hypochloremic, like too much, too much saline. If Dr. Hasabolus goes wild, mm -hmm. you can cause a non-gap metabolic acid. Okay. Now, so people don't always come in with a pure, like reality is uh, complicated. So there are a lot of times people will come in with multiple acid-based disorders. Okay. So the next step is if you have an if you have an anion gap, then what we what I like to, the, the, a lot of people talk about the strong ion difference, and I think it's more I think it's too complicated. I think it's very simple. You what 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 do you call is a the delta gap. So the delta gap is how far is the anion gap from a normal anion gap. So for example, someone comes in with an anion gap of thirty five. Okay, the delta gap is thirty five. Minus 12. 12 is the normal anion gap. You have 23. You take that 23 and add it back to the serum bicarbonate. So if, say the serum bicarbonate is 5. You have a delta, you have an anion gap of 35. You have a delta gap of 23. Your corrected bicarb is 28, which is normal. So in this instance, you have a pure anion gap metabolic acidosis. You have a pure metabolic acidosis. No other competing. Okay. However, sometimes you come in and your CO2 is not five, your CO2 is 20 with an anion gap of 35. The delta gap is 23. 20 plus 23 is 43. Now they have an underlying metabolic alkalosis and they developed an anion gap metabolic acid. Patients with DKA will do like that all, all the time. They were vomiting for five days, and then they, then they developed DKA. Or I had a case where a patient had a bicarb of 45 with an anion gap metabolic acidosis. What? The patient is obese, chronically hypercapnic respiratory failure, chronic hypercapnic respiratory failure, and they developed DKA. So they had an anion gap metabolic acidosis with a bicarb of 45. You'll notice that if your pH is like seven, someone comes in with an anion gap of 35, if their pH is 7.4, then you know that there's, there has to be another, another acid-based disorder coming on. Our patient over there, the bicarb on the blood gas is 37. Now, now the, the blood gas is not accurate. You look at the serum bicarb. If you look at a, the blood gas on the, on the bicarbonate on the blood gas, it's calculated from the, Hazard, the henderson hasselbalch equation. It is, not, it is not always accurate. Go to the serum and look at the serum. That's measured. Okay? So someone like that, 
they're chronically alkalotic because they're compensating for the chronic hypercapnic respiratory failure. Okay? Questions so far? So the delta gap will help you see is there another, is there another? Sometimes they'll come in with an undetectable bicarb, zero. A bicarb of zero. And you do the delta gap and then they come in there and their corrected bicarb is 10. Now this is, or somebody comes in with profound acidosis. That means they came in with an underlying metabolic acidosis, maybe a diabetic with renal tubular acidosis, and then they, then they developed decay. Right? So, the, so when you have a delta, an anion gap metabolic acidosis, do the delta gap uh, <coughs> exercise because it'll tell you, am I dealing with a pure anion gap metabolic acidosis, one basic basis order, or am I dealing with two or even three? That patient who's chronically hypercapnic that develops DKA has actually at least three acid base disorders, has the anion gap metabolic acidosis, has a chronic respiratory acidosis, and then a comp chronic compensatory metabolic alkalosis. That's three acid base disorders in one patient. And if you want to add another one, give them, give them diarrhea. <laughs> okay? And then they come in with a fourth acid base disorder. Real life can be very complicated. So the, so the, del the delta gap is much, it's, for me, it's simpler in my mind than the strong ion difference. And I think that's so complicated. And for me, it's unnecessary. It's not pro I'm probably doing it not the most you know, physiologically accurate from, from an academic perspective, but this is nice, down and dirty to give you a sense of what else is happening, right? So that I don't panic. Top five rules of ICU, don't panic. Okay. So, comp compensation. We have to understand that our principle of compensation is that you will you you do not compensate to normal. The body does not compensate to normal. So if you have a chronic acidosis, your compensation will get you to the acid side of normal. If you comp you will not compensate to a normal pH. You won't. So somebody who lives with a PCO2 of so if you have a if you have a if you have a if you have a blood gas, well, let's let's just back up. In acute respiratory acidosis, this was metabolic acidosis. Now let's talk about respiratory acidosis. Respiratory acidosis. Typical rule for every 10 that the PCO2 goes up, the pH goes down by 0.08. Typical rule. Okay, and the opposite's true. For every 10 that the PCO2 goes down, the pH goes up by 0 0.08. So, if I have a blood gas, okay, and I have a PCO2 of 20, and a PO2 of 100, whatever, what should the pH be? If this is acute respiratory al alkalosis. This is, now this is down from 40. Right. Or up from 40. And we're assuming 7.4 Correct. We're assuming 7.4 is normal. The range is 7.35 to 7.45, but we're saying 7.4. Goes down from 7.4. Uh, 7 okay. So if PCO2 is 20, what do you expect the pH to be? Should drop by 0.16. Should. 7.56. Remember, this is down. You, you expect an acute respiratory alkalosis, the pH will be 7.56. The opposite, the same, the opposite, you were thinking the other way. If I have a, a 60 and 100, the pH should be 7.24. If it's not, that's why an arterial blood gas is very important. Venus doesn't help me as much. Arterial, because I can do this. If it's not, if it's 7.3, that tells me that this is compensative. It's not acute. Right away, by looking at the, by looking at the blood gas. Okay? So that patient, when you have a, a... And again, compensation never goes to normal. So if you have somebody with a chronic respiratory acidosis and then they have a compensatory metabolic alkalosis with a kidneys reabsorbing bicarb, your pH will be this acid side of normal. 732, 731, okay? 733... 
not 7.4. So if you have a blood gas, 7.41, 65, 120, like that patient we have, this, right away, I know that this patient is either has an underlying metabolic alkalosis or this is over, this is not even this is overcompensated that patient is being hyperventilated it's very relevant when you intubate somebody with COPD who's chronically hypercapnic and it's all exciting right and the and everyone's all you know pain oh high tension and so you're bagging the patient and I tell you doctor you know doctor V bag the patient so you bag the you're back in the patient, right? It's all high and hyper, and you're overventilating the patient. And then all of a sudden, they start seizing. Whoa, what happened? That's because you did that. Because you took that patient's CO2 that's 80, and you blew it down to 40. They'll, they've never been at 40. Right? So you have to understand the physiology so you don't harm people. So when I have a, when I have a specialist or a, a whoever tell me, fix that CO2. I say, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. And then I proceed to ignore them. Because if I fix that CO2, I'm going to harm them. Because, again, compensation is never to, never to the normal. It's always to the acid side of normal or the, or the, or the base side of normal, depending on what the, what the underlying chronic acid-base disorder is. So you have to understand that principle of compensation, that the body doesn't go to normal. If you have a chronic respiratory acidosis that is 7.4, that is alkalotic for them. You are hyperventilating them. So, so, so when somebody comes into the emergency department and you get a blood gas and it's 733-125 and 60. Guess what a lot of people do? They start, no, they put them on BiPAP. Now, they may be in respiratory distress, but, by, but what are you trying to do? BiPAP, why? They are ventilating just fine. They don't need to be hyperventilated. There's something else causing the respiratory distress. Fix that. But this blood gas does not need ventilation. Even a PCO2 of 125. So when you get a blood gas and they call, they're going to call the critical first. Doctor, PCO2 is 125. And they're like breathless on the phone. Your job is to calm down. And what's the next question? What's the pH? It's 7.05. Okay. That has to be, you have to intervene. It's I've been but if it's 7.32, oh, okay. And then, then, they, then they, they look at you funny. You're like, why aren't you intervening? I don't have to. You were saying. It's kind of like the patient we got overnight or the one, the one this morning where it was on BiPAP. Exactly. Exactly. If you don't need ventilation, don't put them on BiPAP. But you have to understand the, the, the principles of compensation and chronic hypercapnia and all that to understand to what the patient needs. If the patient just needs oxygenation, then you just do CPAP. If the patient needs oxygenation and ventilation, remember we talked that they're separate, then you put them on bilevel, right? But this, this gas is totally compensated. This, there are people walking on the street with PCO2s of 125. Now, their bicarbonate's going to be 55 or something. Obviously. These people, now you put them in renal failure because you give them a cup of coffee bolus and think that that's going to do it, and they go into renal failure, they're in a whole world of hurt because you just took their crutch and knocked it out from underneath them. They have a broken leg, and they're walking on crutches, and you walk over there, and you grab the crutch, and you grab it from them, and they're going to fall. What do you expect? Because you, you killed the kidney that was saving that patient's life by under-resuscitating that patient. Some, someone chronically hypercapnic, and they come in UTI and sepsis, okay? And they're hypotensive. And you give them a cup of coffee bolus because somewhere, sometime in the, in the distant past, they had CHF. And so we're all terrified of, of, of giving fluid to somebody who had CHF sometime in the, in the, in the, in the, in the past. So we under-resuscitate. We give them a cup of coffee, and it doesn't work. And now the the, 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 the kidneys fail. And so the bicarb goes from 55 to, to, to 25. That pH goes from 7.33 to 6.8. I'm just making up numbers. Now you've harmed that patient. 
because the only thing that's been saving that patient from going into respiratory failure is, are the kidneys that you just killed because you were afraid to give fluid. Because you panicked. So it's very important that someone like this, they need their kidneys. Because the kidney is the only thing saving them. Or somebody comes in, the other, other end, someone comes in with DKA or aspirin toxicity, right? And they're small and they're breathing so deeply and they look frightening, they look scary. But that deep, that, that, that hyperventilation is saving their life. Because otherwise, you, you get rid of that compensation, you know, and you, in, you, if you intubate that patient, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to arrest because you just gave them sucks and etomidates or sucks and propofol and you stop that breathing. And the pH that was 7.0 goes down to 6.7 and they go into PEA. It's totally predictable if you remember the physiology, right? So in fact, the, they you do not intubate someone with a severe metabolic acidosis, as long as they're awake and they can maintain an open airway and all that stuff, because they're, that compensation is saving their life. Fix the underlying cause, and the compensation will go, the, the crystal ball breathing will go away. Right? So it's all about not panicking. It all goes back to not panicking. Um, so understand these, these principles so that you don't harm people. You don't put them on BiPAP, that doesn't mean BiPAP. No, they, they may be hypoxic, whatever, fix the respiratory distress, but they don't necessarily need BiPAP because your PCO2 is so high. You, got, you, you, have to look at, you have to look at the pH and understand what's happening. Is there another, clearly there's, there's, an under, there's another metabolic um, condition going on, right? And so people like this, the, the chronic hypercapnics, you need the, they need their kidneys. That's the only thing saving them is their, is their kidneys. And if you kill it because you don't give them enough fluid, now, now it's a lot harder. They can't compensate because the, 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 there's no other way. You have to give them bicarb. Exogenously, which sometimes I will. Sometimes I will. Questions? Now, like this example, if they had a very, very low EF, like, like it was established. Even if they have a very low like EF, that does not mean that they, they're not dehydrated. Say they're, they're having diarrhea for five days. They're, even if the EF is 10%, you can, now I'm not saying give them 10 liters, yeah. but, yeah. you know, it's assess. Give them, a, give them a bolus. If you put a central line in that, in that patient with EF at 10%, right? But they've been having diarrhea or they've just been bad appetite or they've been fiber off for five days. If their CVP is, say, six. For that patient, that's low. With an EF at 10%, that's a low CVP, right? So even in a patient like that, give them, now don't go wild, but give them and, and see. Are they fluid responsive? If they could, then keep keep giving until they stop being fluid responsive. Or they be, or you notice, oh no, now they now their neck veins are getting bigger. Okay, now they're getting a little bit more short of breath. Then you stop. But just not giving or giving a cup of coffee, and then thinking you've done something to the patient. Well, no, it, don't panic. That's the thing. Just look at the patient and say, okay, even if an EF of ten percent, even if they known have a low EF, they can still be dehydrated, right? They can still come in dehydrated. And you give them just to, to back to where their homeostasis balance, right? And then, and then treat the rest. And if you need vasopressors, do it. And because I had a patient with severe metabolic acidosis from from, uh, and they they saw her. She looked scary when she was breathing, and they tubed her and she coded, just because that's in it. You got rid of the compensation. So don't do that. What other questions you have? Clear? Cool.